Kia ora tato, I'm Marnia Clark. Welcome to Endzone Focus. During this year's Waitangi Day celebrations in Northland, I was privileged to speak with many Christian Māori about the significance of the Treaty of Waitangi and the history behind it. One of the people I spoke to at Waitangi was also able to take up our invitation to come into our studio here in Auckland for a television interview, and I'm delighted to welcome Bishop Kitohi Pikahu, the Anglican Bishop for Te Tahi Tokirau, who's been closely involved with not only the Waitangi Day celebrations, but also the historical Christian celebration, which will take place at Marsden Cross in Northland at the end of this year. Yeah. No mai haramai yeah, ngā mihi nui ki a koe, Bishop Pikahu. Thank you so much for joining us and taking up our invitation to come and chat with us today. Well, I'm very pleased to come in and have a chat about the issues that are quite important to us as Māori and as Christians. Ka pai. And you're so right, this year is a very significant mm. year for all of us as Christians mm. as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the first sermon preached at Rangihaua by yes. Reverend Samuel Marsden. And um, tell us, what were some of the events that led to Reverend Marsden coming mm. to Northland? There's several Māori tūpuna who are prominent in the encounter with Marsden, uh, primarily uh, Te Pahi from the Bay of Islands and the other person is Ruatara. And Ruatara came into contact with Marsden in one of his trips to, to England and thereupon began a very close relationship between Ruatara and with Marsden. Uh, Marsden really came to his aid and from that we, we understand that Ruatara had an, a conversion experience and it's described by Hōtenene Kiretene as having his heart changed towards Christ. And I see that as uh, transformation and conversion. Now that, that was in and around 1809 and Marsden was planning to come in 1809, but because of the the uh, the Boyd incident in Whangaroa, it was delayed some years. Now looking back, the, for five years, that may have been quite uh, advantageous for the mission to Māori, and we're reminded that Marsden was invited to come and to proclaim the gospel. So that relationship with Ruatara was deepened even further. And in that time, other Māori chiefs travelled to Sydney, Hongihika, Waikato, Korokoro, and they cemented the one the relationship and two the invitation to come. So that day, Christmas Day, uh, eighteen fourteen. What do you know about what happened? Well, the the records will show that um, Marsden came spending two nights in Matauri first, Gatikura, and when they came into the bay. They, they were out just off the shore and Ruatara had prepared everything for Marsden to come ashore on Christmas Day. And the intention was that an area would be prepared. Uh, evidently, Hongiheka and the other chiefs were quite accustomed to the pews and wanted to have some, some logs put down to resemble pews. And then Marsden came ashore and preached from the Gospel of St. Luke, Chapter 2. And thereupon, we, we now celebrate the 200th years of uh, that first sermon. And who was there? Well, a number of those chiefs I've mentioned, and uh, several hundred who came and made their way to Rangihaua, to Oihi, well, well in advance of, of that day, and therefore coming with great expectation, I believe. That expectation would be more about uh, an inquiry, uh, would be more by saying to to each other, let's go in here or, and go and see what's going to happen. Let us go with our whanaunga and, and see uh, what it is that is coming among us. And obviously settlers were there as well? O only those who came on the ship. So all Māori there except those who came with uh, Mars and, and Ruatara, Hongi, Korokoro, Waikato and others. That's Hanson and King. Right. And how much of the Christmas message do you think Māori really understood that day? Well, I, I would be uh, of a mind to say that very little from Marsden himself, because uh, that would be their first exposure, one, to a Christian form of worship in the terms of the gathering, but two, that whatever words he spoke, the, the meaning, 
the the spirit of of that first sermon would have to be conveyed uh, within uh, the ability for our tupuna to comprehend or to conceive what was happening, and that was Ruatana's uh, task to somehow to interpret that to the gathering. And there was a a question asked in Maori, what is this man saying to us? And Ruatana responded by saying, in time it shall be revealed to you. And so how did the iwi, the people, respond? Well, uh, there's a very thrilling and exciting response that I I have uh, uh, been trying to talk about for some time now. Te Hari a Ngāpuhi is the dance of Ngāpuhi, the dance of joy of Ngāpuhi. And Hōtere Nekiritene writes this down saying that several hundred Māori then uh, began to gather on the shore there on the beach and they began the hadi. A hadi is a form of a haka. And it's a hadi is, uh, as the word suggests, is joy. And then these are the words they chanted. Kanuku nuku kaneke neke. Kanuku nuku kaneke neke. Titi roki ngawai o tokerau e hora nei. Mehe pipi farau roa ki tua. Takoto te pai. Takoto te pai. And in my own understanding of, of that, it was an attempt by our tūpuna to somehow uh, respond to what they understood was happening among them. Something very new, something foreign perhaps. But the words really do describe their response. In other words, there is some movement. There is move, movement forwards, backwards, to the side. And that movement, I believe, was uh, about creating space. Creating space for the gospel to come into their to their world as they knew it, to their community, to their lives, and into their hearts, so that uh, the the message proclaimed and the pipi farauroa is mentioned, the shining cuckoo, is the bird, is the herald bird that heralds spring, that heralds something new, some new life and new beginnings, and if they could conceive that, then I believe they were starting to grapple with it, in the sense of the gospel. So. The final words of the Hari are takoto te pai, and it's re-emphasized, takoto te pai, which means literally, let good be established, let peace be established. But I think theologically it's about the kingdom of God being established, and therefore the reign of God being established among our tupuna. Now that's how I understand that, and uh, I, I believe that it's probably close to where our tupuna were, because part of the, the, the grappling with what was happening was the acceptance of something that was being proclaimed and the acceptance to be, continue that journey. What could you tell us about what you know about what the relationship between Ruatara's people and the early missionaries were like? Because um, how did they find um, two people from different cultures, different worldviews, how did they find common ground? <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's probably good to understand that between 1809 and 1814 was enough time to start um, preparing uh, our tūpuna there, and particularly Ruatara's people. There would have been uh, probably the invitation to come to Ohi, to Rangihaua, that that invitation meant there would be some kind of deepening of contact and relationship. We understand that uh, the Ohi were the situs of the proclamation of the first sermon, just standing uh, over and above and shadowing perhaps Oihi is Rangiawa Pa. And that's an indication that uh, the Tupuna were living there, the missionaries were invited to to, op- to begin their settlement there in Oihi. And they had some very good relationships going. There was uh, mostly on the Māori part who were able to, to uh, provide that uh, whenua there for the missionaries to stay but also where the missionaries could then begin to offer some of their uh, knowledge about things in order to uh, to live themselves there. Now that did that did blossom, um, and, it, and it meant that because when they began to, to expand, they then moved from Oihi through to Te Puna, up the river into Kirikiri finally. And so uh, one, one would it be right to understand that those uh, relationships were on a very strong basis. And you have a personal connection, a legacy to those early missionaries in your whānau. Tell us about that. Well, I'm a descendant of some of the tūpuna who 
who who were, were gathered there, but I'm not from that area. I'm from uh, on my my father's mother's side, from the Fungoro area. And so Hongi Hick himself, who provided uh, some of the uh, the, the uh, I, I I used to word oversight, but protection. That's another word. I don't think it was meant really protection, but just um, offer his totoko. I'm descended from his brother, and uh, that that in itself meant that all all of those uh, tupuna were very much uh, inclined to uh, accept the uh, Christian faith, and so uh, further the Fangoro Harbour, there's there's the settlements where that took place, and of course where uh, tupuna were were converted and baptized later on, and so that that gives me a great um, sense of pride as well. And also, with their pride comes the obligation to ensure that if our tupuna were able to conceive in, in their hearts and their minds uh, the Christian faith, then at least the responsibility on the descendant to ensure that there is some continuation of that. Bishop Pikahu, there's still so much more I'd love Inakwe. to chat with you about, but first we'll take a quick break. Inakwe. No my hooky my welcome back to part two of Enzone Focus. My studio guest is Bishop Kitohi Pikahu. Bishop, can we talk about the Treaty of Waitangi yes. and its formation? What was the intent behind it? Well, quite uh, clearly, by the years from when Henry Williams had arrived in Paihia, 1823, and in the 1830s, uh, and just prior to the declaration, 28th of October 1835, Henry Henry was aware and other missionaries that the new settlers were posing uh, issues that uh, Henry and others were concerned about, and um, began to, to to think around uh, the issue of what kind of protection could the sovereign uh, provide for for Maori, because they could they could see it coming, and so um, by the time when, when Hobson came over and they began to, to um, start putting words together for a treaty, the missionaries certainly were uh, quite instrumental. One, in, in, the, in the translation of the treaty, Te Tito Waitangi, and also in the conversations and discussions with the Māori Tupuna to ensure that their interests and their rights were being preserved. And it was all about that. How could they be protected from these other uh, Parker rivals coming in who, who, who were actually posing a big problem? And uh, I, I'm thankful that, that the missionaries were proactive in that sense. And because of the missionaries, a lot of Māori leaders signed? Yes, because by then they had formed very strong relationships with the chiefs. And there I believe that the, the Tupuna who signed put their trust in the the missionaries and what Henry and others were, were beginning to to encourage Māori to uh, to put their tohu, their mark on the treaty. Now their trust was was uh, largely because of Henry's acceptance by Māori, and I think that's a, a huge a huge responsibility. And I'm really um, pleased and uh, and I'm proud because that's our Christian heritage that. The church at the time, Church Mission Society and the other churches present, sought to uh, do whatever they could to provide this protection of Māori and particularly the Māori interests. It's been nearly 175 years since the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Next year is the 175th yes. anniversary. Yes. Has the original intent of the treaty, has that changed over the years? Definitely. Um, what, what we know in history is that soon after the signing of the treaty, there began some of the, uh, the battles between Māori and, and, and the settlers. And so I can, I can point straight to Rua Pika Pika or Hawaii Kawiti. So that, that then indicates that the relationship was beginning to be strained. And of course, many Māori from the 1860s and onwards were making petitions to England to say, you know, the the, the, the treaty that we, we signed up to, we put our trust into, 
um, is not being honored. So that's, that's quite a fact of history. I do believe, um, and, and, uh, and this is probably a good point here to raise, is that um, certainly there was a, a great turnaround. Um, a lot of that is, needs to be put in the right context. And if Māori weren't uh, uh, making these petitions uh, in the 19th century and the 20th century, uh, we would be uh, still having to do that today. But nevertheless, we as a society have matured. And there are other all, all forms of legislation that are taking place. Um, the Anglican Church, for one, and the Methodist Church, Presbyterian churches, most of the Christian churches have begun to mark that in, in the way in which uh, the churches respond to the issues of, of treaty matters and relationship between Māori and Pākehā. How do you? How different do you think Aotearoa would be if we didn't have the treaty? Well, um, it's, it's hard to conceive it, but uh, if there was no treaty, uh, we would be in dire straits. Uh, there, there, there would be no, no, no standard by which um, the, the, the relationship between Māori and Tauiwi could ever be measured, and it would be virtually, a, 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 you know. A, uh, a situation in where where there, there'll be no one's rights being protected except those who are the who are the, the, the powerful. And to remember at the time of the treaty, we were the the majority, so that trust was uh, a massive one in the fact that uh, Maori chose to uh, be by by the missionaries advised to probably by their own. We know that many Maori were a bit um, cautious about it, which would have been right. Nevertheless, it was a, a journey of trust, built on trust. And that's why the churches, particularly in the government, have a, a huge obligation to honour that. And, and so uh, the inroads have been made. Uh, some will say not enough, but certainly there's, they're being, um, being made. Do you think it would help restore the relationship between the Crown and Māori if we as Christians understood the original intent or actually you know the rest of the nation definitely and as an anglican bishop what i can say is the anglican church itself had to be reminded of its involvement not only in the in leading the, the lead up to the treaty but post treaty times and of course a lot of that um, is where the questions around the acquisition of fenua was throughout and the anglican church only in the 1980s began to take seriously its role, and the way it did that was to revise its constitution to reflect uh, the partnership between Māori and Tawiwi, and that's only one step in in the in the redress that was required. So that's where where the Anglican Church approached that, and I'm proud as a Anglican to say that we we certainly made our stand as a church, and our responsibility now is how do we continue to nurture that. Exactly. So what is the role of the church and all of us as Christians to help improve that relationship and be more, be more effective in uh, evangelising and spreading the message of God's love to Māori? Yes, and I think that is the, that is the truth of the gospel. Uh, what, what, whatever it is, it is to ensure the, the kingdom of God, the reign of God in the world. And the place of the church there is to to continue to to proclaim that truth, and that uh, our God is a God of of truth, of compassion, and of justice, and in that way, therefore, the Christian churches have the the highest obligation to ensure that all, all of what we as Christian as the Christian church uh, are, are involved in is to ensure that God's love. Uh, God's truth, God's compassion, God's justice is uh, the reality in Aotearoa New Zealand society. So nearly 200 years on from that first gospel message being preached and yourself having received a legacy of mm. the gospel message by your tūpuna, what would you do to ensure that that legacy continues on for future generations? Therein lies the, the challenge to all Christians, and, and particularly uh, Christian leaders. Because of, the, of, the, of our history that has uh, uh, been established within, particularly for Māori and for myself as a Christian, 
as an Anglican to ensure that if our tupuna could conceive that what is being proclaimed like the Pipi Wharaurua heralding a new dawn, uh, new life, new, new, uh, a new world and that we've got to have the same degree of trust and, and hope that uh, that message as uh, we are reminded from scripture is the same yesterday, today and forever. And I would be concerned as a Christian leader to ensure that our children, our mokopuna and the generations coming after you and I will have faith. That the Christian faith will be a reality in their lives and in their world. So that they too, like our tupuna, can make space for the faith to, to be born in their hearts, in their minds, in their lives. Uh, that we will all know together uh, God's love, truth, compassion and justice. In closing, in this election year, is there anything you'd like to ask politicians to do to help further this, uh, this important uh, merging of relationships and bettering of relationships? Yes, well, I'm a person that, that I believe uh, to each individual person uh, and those members of parliament who are elected have their own conscience. And many of them are Christian. And many of them face challenges about making the right decisions or otherwise. Uh, my, my own prayer for each person is elected by the people of Aotearoa New Zealand uh, themselves are able to understand that, that history and the legacy, but also uh, to themselves be, be guided by their own faith, if they are people of faith, and uh, by their conviction that and all of what the government is involved in, and that is making policy decisions that affect the lives of others, that they too can somehow conceive and include in their decision making God's love, God's compassion, generosity, and God's justice. Now, mihi nui ki koe, Bishop Pikahu, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. Tēnā koe. And that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for watching. Ka kite anō. God bless.